Says, get that India, big boy. Mike Asimo! Call an ambulance! Maybe call a priest! Oh, what a shot! What a shot! Campbell Killer! Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Cumberland Throw Instant Reaction Podcast. How good was that win today? How good is any win over Manly? Oh, we've got a few Manly supporters in here. That's okay. We don't mind you being in here. <laughs> so, this evening, we are fortunate to have an Eels legend. He is Parramatta player 382, number 382. He's a kangaroo. He's played origin football. He played 121st grade games. 12 tries, 48 goals, two field goals. He's been the winner of the Premiership on three occasions with the Eels. Please make him welcome, John Muggleton. John, we're going to start off with a little bit about yourself and then we're going to talk about today's game. First of all, you played most of your, of your games in the second row or centre, but there was actually one game that you played at fullback back in 1982 and we recorded a victory over Wests on that day. How good were you on that day? Yeah, I was good for about 75 minutes until they put a bomb up, which I dropped and they scored a try off that <laughs> It was actually, I'd played for Australia in the second row on, on, the, uh, on the weekend before and uh, Sturlo pulled out on the uh, morning of the game so they put Paul Taylor to halfback and I'd played uh, the whole of the 1980 series uh, uh, season at uh, fullback in the under 23s so I was next choice so they threw me in. Oh, so it wasn't a completely foreign role to you? No, no. A lot of people said I, you know, stood back near the fullback uh, a lot of the time anyway, but uh, no, uh, no, I'd, I'd certainly played in the backs a lot before that. So I'm going to stick with your football exploits, and you've actually got a pretty big kit bag of tools because you kicked a field goal in a certain game at the SCG, didn't you? Well, coming from rugby union as a number 10 in rugby union, I could drop kick, um, and I was a goal kicker as well, so... Um, you know, it was a couple of seconds to go in a game. It was 20 all, and uh, and I was lucky enough to kick a field goal. Struck so. it sweet. Uh, I, I mentioned before about the representative honours that you had winning premierships. Now, this might be a question which is sort of like, what's your favourite child? But is it possible to define what's the best experience representative football or winning a premiership, or you just can't separate it? Oh, no, look, it, in 1981, I was only in for the last couple of games and so I didn't play the whole season there. Um, and, and, you know, I was 21-year-old winning a, a grand final with all those other 21-year-olds that, that we had. And, uh, but 1982, I started the season strong. I played City, State and Australia. I played just about every game for Parramatta. Um, and, you know, we, we went through the semis... Uh, Manly beat us in the major semi-final, which, uh, which luckily enough I was dropped for. So after that, Jack brought me back for the final and the grand final, which we knocked off Eastern Suburbs, and then we knocked off Manly in the grand yes, final. Yes, so. yes, knocked off Manly in the big one, the one that mattered. And then, the thing about that is, you know, in the semi-final when they beat us, um, there was a lot of ill discipline from us. Um, but as we were leaving the field. Uh, a couple of the manly blokes were yelling out at us saying, oh, we won't see you again. Eastern Suburbs will beat you next week. And uh, it was terrific because, you know, it, we're just made two weeks later when we came and kicked their backsides just even more sweet. <laughs> uh. You started a number of games off the bench. 
you also mentioned your history as a fly half in rugby union. That versatility must have made you a valuable interchange player. Yeah, I'd, nobody wants to be an interchange player. Like, if you go and talk to the four blokes on the bench out there and say you're, you're a great interchange player, uh, yeah, you, you better defend yourself. So, now, yeah, it... it 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 made me easy to pick uh, to to pick in a lot of a uh, lot of positions. So after '86, Mick Cronin had, had retired, and I was originally brought to the club in 1980 to replace you know because Mick was going to retire. So after six years of play or seven years of playing <laughs> with him, um, he retired, and then they moved me from the second row out to the centres. So, uh, which, which was a bit difficult at the size I was because they bulked me up during the off-season. So, uh, yeah, and the fact I could kick goals, used to take the dropouts, you know, it, it more was a second uh, technical kicker. It was more, you know, I brought a lot to be picked first rather than be picked on the bench. Because in those days, remember that you had to play at least a half a game in a lower grade before you could run on as a reserve in first grade. Sixties and I speak about the stigma of starting versus being an interchange player. And for a long time, there was the prestige of being one of the starting 13 players. But in the modern game, it feels like there's been a bit of a transition where the value of that utility player off the interchange has risen, especially given concussions and the impact in the game in that regard. Do you see the, the versatility of playing in the interchange being better these days? Um, I, I think you'd still like to start. You know, but you look at uh, Junior coming off the bench today and, yep. and Ryan Madison, I thought, was outstanding when he came in. He was, they were the two who changed the, the tempo of the game. So, But I think they're our two best forwards, so I'd be starting them. But, but uh, yeah, if that's a mentality, you know, you, you, you can't sell that to blokes my age, but you could maybe sell it to the current generation that's sitting on the bench. That's fair. Because you get... Well, well, the other thing is that if you if you started a game, you had to play more than half a game to get the full uh, full win bonus. So nobody wanted to come off the bench to <laughs> do all the hard work with 29 minutes to go. That, that, that is fascinating. And then insight. get paid half as much. Mm -hmm. I tell you what, that was uh, that was an interesting apprenticeship that you served for six years, like being brought to the club because Mick was going to retire, and in that time you won premierships, uh, you won uh, representative honours. Um, so, like, it's, I mean, it's interesting where life takes you as a footballer. You might be expecting one thing and something different happens. Well, you know, there's, there's that old saying, as long as you're getting picked in first grade, you'll play anywhere. Um, it's, it's not 100% true because I'd never play hooker with my neck. I'd be dead. <laughs> um, but, you know, I played, I played wing, fullback, centre, um, Lock second row, and, and when I was captain coach, I even played a game in the front row. I don't know how that happened when, <laughs> when I picked the team, but it happened. <laughs> oh, uh, obviously, there was some sort of medical episode going on when you made that decision yourself. <laughs> I had two front rowers pull out with hamstring injuries, so it shows you how soft they were. <laughs> you, you mentioned the kicking. Were you a reluctant kicker, or was that something you enjoyed? No, I kicked all through the juniors, you know... Uh, um, kicked, kicked, you know, all my life. So when they asked me to do it here, um, it wasn't wasn't a problem. So we look at your teammates now, and uh, obviously winning three premierships in a row and, and a fourth one thrown in there for good measure. It must have been a pretty talented and competitive team. Who was the most competitive teammate in that era? Oh, definitely Ron Hilditch, uh, the hooker going uh, into front row. Uh, we made the mistake, he wanted to play indoor cricket and we made the mistake of playing <laughs> with him. He, he was the most competitive. And, and uh, Jack Gibson used to have... Ron didn't have the best hands, you know, because he was a hooker front rower, but we were training one night and Ronnie uh, dropped three footies in the early part of training and Jack said to him, if you drop another one, I'm going to get the stickum out. Now, stickum was American <laughs> gridiron spray. gum that everybody has to spray in that now. But Jack used to import it himself from America. And it, we always thought it was a bit of a, 
you know, put you down if you had to put stick them on your hands to catch a football, even though you could stand there like that and <laughs> go like that and you couldn't drop it. Um, but Ronnie has is, is gone, no, Jack, no, no. So the rest of the night was the funniest training session I've ever seen. You know, Bob O'Reilly's running across, throwing it at his ankles and Ronnie's, <laughs> having, Ronnie's taking slips, catches and Bear's throwing it behind him. Jack was killing himself laughing, as were we all, but Ronnie was having a nightmare because the last thing he wanted to do was go and put that stick him on his hands. Well, that's a bit of a, I guess, a bit of an insight into Jack Gibson as a coach. Could he enjoy a good laugh like that with the team? I mean, was that a, an uncommon thing or, you know, how did you find him in terms of that sense of humour? Well, he told plenty of jokes and plenty of blokes laughed at him. Um, not all of them were funny, but if Jack t- told a joke, everybody laughed yeah, because it was usually on a Tuesday night and that's when selections were. So, um, yeah, no, but we had a lot of fun um, when we were playing. Before training, Jack would be out there with us and we'd, we, we didn't kick footballs around. We had a bat and a, bo- and a cricket ball and we'd be bowling to each other, hitting catches. And Jack was a first-grade cricketer, so he'd get out there and roll his arm over and... Um, yeah, so it, it, there was plenty of good fun. Because yeah, most of us were, you know, 2021 20, in 8081. So, you know, we, we all grew up together. You know, some of us haven't still grown up, but, uh, but Eric and Brett and myself and Sturlo and, and uh, Neil Hunt and uh, um, Steve Ella, we're all the same age. And we all played junior reps either together or against each other. So... You know, we're, we're all pretty close, so we like to have a good time on and off the field. Now, we're, we're aware of some of the talents of the players in the team. Eric Groth, obviously, with his music. Uh, Neville Glover with his dancing. Neville actually demonstrated some of his dancing skills one night for us when we were on up in uh, Jack's. And obviously, Gibbo himself as a dog whisperer. Were there any other players who had some hidden talents and they could actually back it up. Well, just get back to Neville. The the problem with Neville at the size he is now is that when the music stopped dancing and he stops dancing, not all of his body stops (laughs) stops moving at the same time. So, um, no, look, in in those times we worked and, and, uh, and played footy and trained for footy. So, you know, I... I love golf, and but w- when I was playing, I hardly played golf at all, except in in the off season. So, you know, we, we'd like to get out there, and a few of us like to hit the ball around. But yeah, uh, Brett Kenny was an excellent, excellent baseball player. He's, he, his hand-eye coordination is unbelievable, and that that indoor cricket team that we had, he was the wicket keeper, and he'd be taking slips catches, you know, in in that, which is not. Not diff- not easy, really. Um, so, and, and look, that's why he took so many intercepts because he, he he's just uh, unbelievable between eye and hand. You know, uh, I remember when we were uh, we did an interview with the Bear, and he spoke about Artie Beetson in a similar vein. Just said he could do anything uh, squash, snooker, you know, anything that involved hand-eye coordination. He was a freak. Uh, Arthur, Arthur was wonderful to play with. I, I played with him at the end of his career, but, you know, growing up... Um, and it's funny, Bobby talking about him, because you talk to all the old-timers uh, who went on a kangaroo tours, and they'd say, in Australia, Arthur was the best front rower ever, but when you, when you got into the slower grounds overseas, Bob O'Reilly was in a class of his own. How do you reckon a player like Junior Paulo, with his ball skills would have fitted into the game back in the late 70s, early 80s? I think, you know, it, it, all skills transferable. So, you know, it, it, I, I think the difference there would be, you know, the, the second try we scored today was the only time somebody passed a ball to a ball playing forward and then backed up and got it back. You know, we tend to give it to our, our good ball players and then everybody stands back for them to hit and, and pass the ball back, where, where blokes like O'Reilly and could get through the tackle and offload on the other side. 
And to, to, to be able to do that, the bloke who gives you the ball has got to be responsible for you and back you up. And, and I think that's fallen out of the game and that's what we need to get back into it. Going back uh, more years than I care to think now, I played a little bit of representative schoolboy union and back then they were coaching us on the Muggleton defence. And, of course, in reference to yourself, who was a coach for the Wallabies at the time, Take me back to when you played the game at the age of 16. How did your years in the code of 15 players versus 13 shape you and, and make you the player you were as a league? Oh, definitely the uh, ability to catch and pass. Um, catch, pass, kick. Um, that, was, that was my go. And, you know, when I came to Parramatta, I, I could put a bloke through the hole before the line easily. But, uh, but blokes like Bob O'Reilly and Arthur... They showed me and, and deliberately showed me, took me aside after training and, and showed me different things and we ran against each other um, on how to get the ball out after you've been tackled or as you get through the tackle, which is one of the skills that, that in those days you had to have. Um, you know, when I was at Balmain, I was at Balmain for a couple of years, that's where I started because I was a Balmain junior, um, there was none of that. There was none of the older blokes uh, helping the younger blokes, and uh, that was pretty well why we weren't successful. And what about the reverse? How did your time in the league help you as a coach in rugby union? I think the, the fact that I turned up and I worked on skill. You know, they'd had lots of blokes turn up for one session and they say, you've got to get out there and bash them and all that sort of stuff. I started talking about body position and the angle you approach to make the tackle and putting yourself in the best position. And, and I was employed as the defensive coach, so it was serious. Like, that was my job. They knew it was my job, and I was not a guest coach. I was the bloke that they had to listen to and because uh, it was my job to teach them. And arguably the last peak of rugby union in the country too, your time there in the code. Yeah, well, it was a golden age. We had some pretty good players as well, so, yeah... We won five Bledisloe Cups in a row. Yep. We won a World Cup and ran second in a World Cup and ran fourth in a World Cup. Uh, we beat the British and Irish, Irish Lions for the first time and uh, won two Tri-Nations. So, you know, we haven't done a lot of that since. Not bad on the resume, eh? Yeah. <laughs> now, last question on Union. You're a Dundas Valley boy from your Union days. Uh, I used to play against Dundas Valley playing for the North Mead Rugby Union Club. But a lot of those clubs that played back in those days, the junior clubs, they don't exist anymore. Clubs like Wente and Westmead, for example. What's the state of rugby union these days? Does it still have a strong future or is it in trouble? Oh, look, I think, I think all contact sport was in trouble five years ago because, you know, and even as far back as ten years ago because mothers were... Uh, reluctant to have their sons little boys go out there and get bashed up and but since the advent of the uh, NRLW and the, the Super Rugby uh, women's uh, the Australian Sevens and their success um, it, it's basically saved us because now girls are going to mum and saying I want to play rugby a rugby league or rugby union and the mum goes oh yeah of course because they never say no to their daughters <laughs> and then when the boy comes along they go oh yeah I've got to let you play as well so I think I think the women's game has, has uh, saved us and uh, <laughs> well yeah it toughens you up if you marry one of them when you go home and <laughs> well let's let's talk about today's win who enjoyed today's win <laughs> Now, Margo, I have to say, at the start of the game, I was sitting there thinking, this could be 40 nil. What was running through your mind at that time? Uh, I was replacing both defenders on the left-hand side edge. <laughs> so I was getting them both off and putting anybody there that, that was going to stop them. But um, Listen, the, the start was exactly how Manly play football. Uh, you know, they, they, they're like Penrith... In there, the only team that use a ball-playing second rower, so Jake Trevojevic, they go half to the ball-playing second rower, which leaves them a, a short runner who's a forward, which leaves them then 5-8 full back and a centre. And as, as the play goes, as the passes go, 
the runners get faster and it's harder to run them down it's harder to drift to get them and and it took us a good 20 minutes to get on top of that and it and and to get the ball and then manly made a few mistakes and 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 we were good enough and our forwards started running with a bit of purpose and we got a few offloads and and it turned around but um you know definitely we should have been prepared for that because that's how Manly play football and they shouldn't have had that lead because we should have been able to defend it right from the start. So how do you adjust to that when you're out there in the game and they've got that sort of play? I mean, we assume that it, like Parramatta had prepared for it, but it, maybe it was, they weren't executing as they should. So what sort of... <coughs> is it a matter of just getting out the message you know, get to what we've worked for or do you think there was some adjustment that was made? Uh, I, th- I think two things happened. I think our wingers were far too tight and our defensive, uh, uh, defensive line was far too narrow. It made it easy when they hit it up in the middle because we had five blokes around where they had two, but when, when as soon as they went wide, they had five blokes where we had two. So I think we spread a lot better. And I think the, the edge forward, the first edge forward who's inside the, the number seven or number six worked harder. And so it allowed us to go early. You know, it, there were times there early where our forwards were just sitting on their heels on the inside. And, and that, that move was always open when, that the try was brought back from. You know, um, they could have got us on that plenty of times. So a lot of... NRL teams seem to operate that same sort of slide defence. So is it all about what's happening in the middle and the, and the, or the edge and that movement from them or does it still come back to those players out wide? Well, yeah. Uh, I could take forever. I could take you out in the field. And <laughs> this, this used to be what I did for a living. But <laughs> Well, it's funny that but, I asked the question. But... but <laughs> There is a trigger for when the, the last two blokes should, should either drift or they should close. And we, we don't have it. We don't have it. It goes on one person's decision. If I'm closing and going through, did you notice that most of the time the centre was doing it and the winger was four, four or five metres behind him? And that's where that tap-on just beat us every time. If that winger's up there... The bloke who the ball's tapped onto, the winger hits him. So there's no communication there. And it's probably been since Jason Taylor and uh, Joel Reddy were together for that grand final in 2001 that we've had a problem on that side of the field. And and doesn't matter who the coach is, doesn't matter who the player is, we, we just haven't fixed it. Is that a problem for a lot of clubs or is it a problem for a few like us? Well, everybody attacks the same, so... You know, once they get a roll on, if that second man play to blokes who are fast. South Sydney used to be the best at it, but, uh, you know, they can't hold the ball for long enough to do it now. So, yeah, it's the same for everybody. So what, what was the turning point for you in this match then? Because Manly's got all the momentum. It looks like they can score at will on our left side. How did the match turn, in, in your opinion? Uh, the offload try. The offload try and a couple of sets after that. So we put us two points behind them. Um, and they'd had all the pressure. Everybody in the crowd was saying, how the hell are we only two points behind after that start? So, um, yeah. And, and I think Manly dropped their heads. I, I, it was very concerning. You know, people talk about how many uh, Manly players that we picked up over the years. We certainly, whenever we kicked downfield, we had four or five manly players after three tackles still behind our defensive line getting on, getting on side. So I, I think they, they came out and, and uh, brought the storm and then when we weathered the storm and were only two behind, they, uh, they'd blown their, uh, their best. Well, it was certainly frenetic when we started. I mean, you, you, you talked about... OK, there's some offloads that are just offloads. They're not done with that purpose of a, a player getting it to the ball player and then backing up to take a, a return pass. But that, off, that offloading became really frenetic midway and then later in that uh, first half from us. Yeah. Um, 
Was that advantageous for us? Did it um, add in some fatigue for Manly? Or, or, you know, how did you see that sort of play? Yeah, it was all right when uh, the player was going forward, you know, and, and wasn't held by three blokes in a stationary position. When If you pass a ball from a stationary position to a bloke who's stationary, you might as well have taken the ball and played it yourself because it, it gives you nothing because they've had time to, to react to it. But if you go through and you can get on the front foot and then offload, um, that's, that's different because then you're getting in the space where they don't have defence rather than staying in front of all their defence. And I think we saw a classic try that the Eels scored in the first round against the Bulldogs where it went offload into a gap, offload into the gap and, and Cartwright got over yeah. for the try. And look, we, you know, we, we, lo we lost a, a lot of opportunities by Blake's just dropping the ball cold on the goal line. Uh, and then Tuolagi's try right at the end, you know, he, that was brave. He hit that hole and he took the ball that was fired like a bullet. Uh, that's that's how that's how the other blokes who dropped it earlier they they hit it soft. Um, he he wanted to score that try and there was no way he wasn't going to score. So yeah. it, well done to him. You know I thought he made a, a great impact when he came on. So uh, yeah, earlier, good good to see him playing second row rather than centre. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so that's a fair call. Earlier on you pointed towards the injection of Junior Barlow and Ryan Madison as one of the turning points early in that contest. Are the forwards the primary identity of this team or do you think there's some sort of mix elsewhere of the halves? Where, where would you look at as the real strength for the Eels in 2024? Oh, at their best, I'd say it's the forwards, yeah. yeah. I, 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 would, I would call our number nine a tradesman player. Like, mm -hmm. you know, he'll turn up every week and, you know, he, he, he won't win you a game but he won't lose you a game either. Um, but we've got some quality front row there. I thought Sean Lane was was below his best today. Yeah, a couple of drops yeah. today. A couple of drops and a, and a couple of soft um, tackles as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think we've got to start with Palo to get the uh, the momentum from kickoffs and from, from penalties and from whatever phase play. And Madison as well. Because one thing I know about Ryan Madison after watching him for a long time... He knows when not to pass the ball. And so he's far more reliable than the other blokes because they'll, they'll get it in their head that I'm going to get an offload here and they'll offload it even if it's not on. Ryan Madison, won't, if, he, if he knows he's in a bad position, he won't offload. So I, I like that about him. We had a young bloke that was making his debut today. What did you all think of Blaze Talungi's debut today? Did you like it? What did you... What did you make of the... the obviously, he's, he's got a lot of learning to do. And we don't know how long he'll be up in first grade. It might be just filling a hole this week. A little cup of coffee this week, yeah. yeah. But overall, what was your take on his performance today? He was OK. Um, you know, it was, was solid without being... He got done in defence. Mm -hmm. um, his friggin' boot came off. Um, which is so put him running around on one sock for you know and I, I noticed that Manly went at him three plays in a row which was that's what you do if somebody's minus a boot um, and then he dropped that ball coming out off our line but but why why there are none of our forwards or our senior players back there to carry that up I don't know we shouldn't be having a the young bloke on his debut when we're up by 10 points, trucking it up out of our area. It, it should be somebody else's job, not his. How did you rate that try that he scored? Because he certainly had the confidence to take on um, Tommy Turbo right on that uh, right towards the line. He's, I mean, Tommy's not a small build and he's, uh, he can hit pretty hard in defence. Uh, I thought it was, I thought it was uh, indicative of uh, the mindset of Blaze Talungi, which is, I'm going to have a crack. Yeah, and and he he, he was not going to be stopped, was he? So, you know that that sort of definite play is is what you want from your centre, just to go for. If you get the chance, go for it. And uh, 
you know, that's that's what worries me about uh, our defence is they should be well trained enough that if they see that opportunity, not only do they go themselves, but they communicate with those around them and they go together. John? It's a game of momentum in rugby league these days, more so than ever. Once you get a run of possession, you often see teams scoring once, twice for us. We saw that today, Manly jumped out to a 14-point lead. In your experience playing rugby week, what is the best way to arrest momentum when it's against you? And what's the best way to harness it when it's in your favour? Yeah, watch the referee because he wants to give the attacking team a penalty. Uh, so you can't, you can't give the referee any, any excuse. You're better off giving them um, 15 more metres in their set of six by being a little bit clean skin rather than giving them another 60 metres from, from a penalty and another set of six. So um, that was one of the things that Jack was always about. He said the referee wants to penalise you in the first set of six. Don't give him an excuse. Don't give him a chance to get into the game. And if you, th if you saw these manly plugs, will tell you straight away, the number of penalties when the momentum came our way um, compared to when the momentum... When, when they got... When you got all the penalties, you had the momentum. Yeah, well, we could have changed the referee after 20 as well, but... <laughs> <laughs> Actually, just before half-time, we could have changed the referee. Yeah, just a, a little knock-on and obstruction. Knock-on, yeah. uh, obstruction. Uh, but we won't talk... We're not going to talk about the referee he, tonight. He made the best... The, the, <laughs> the, the obstruction no try was, was a sensational decision. Well, uh, yeah, that one was. That one was. We're, we're all for that one. That, that, that actually saved the embarrassment of the missed forward pass that was thrown for the uh, the final uh, pass. It, yeah, but the, 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 the blokes upstairs can't rule on forward pass. It, no, that's it right. wouldn't be a game yeah. rugby league if both sides weren't grumbling about the officials after the game, I suppose. Uh, we're, we're now at that point where we're going to give our, our best three players of the match as we wrap this up. So we're going to go for a 3-2-1, the best... The best players out on the field. I'm going to go the uh, the three points. I think for um, it has to be a forward. To, uh, no, sorry. No, I'm going to go Dylan Brown. I thought Dylan Brown. He provided some of the big moments in the game. He asked lots of questions any every time he ran the ball. So I'll I'll give him my three points. Margot, what's who would get your top points tonight? Um. Yeah, the number 10, Paolo. Yep. Oh, he turned the game when he came on. So, you know, I, I know I'm rabbiting on and it's like a broken record, but you get your best front rower and your best second rower on the field right from the start. Yeah. I'm going to ride on Muggo's coattails here. Junior came on, sets up the try for Mitchell Moses and gives us the physicality through the middle to establish ourselves in the ruck. Three points. Yeah, well, that's then easy for me to pick my two points because I'm going with Junior. For my two points, Muggo, your two points. Yeah, I'll give you Dylan Brown. You know, with uh, Mitchell not uh, not full on with his kicking and his involvement, I thought Dylan stepped up, and that's that's as Dylan sort of Brown we've been waiting for for the last couple of years. The bloke who can take over, you know, that that side of the game. So we've got two of them rather yeah. than just all the pressure on one. Two points, Dylan. My only complaint is not about Dylan, it's about the fact that he's creating a lot of opportunities, jinking back through the ruck, just needs to pick up, have someone be able to pick up on that short ball coming across, so not his fault. And my one point, what I liked about this particular player was he helped to settle our frenetic play, and that's Matto. I thought when he came into the game, we straightened up we settled in the forward play, and then especially in that second half, where we needed to be settled, we were settled. And we, we built up that defensive fatigue for Manly, and I think that went a long way to shutting down their attack. Mago, your one point? Uh, Penasini. Yeah. I, I think he was good in defence. I think he carried the ball off our line. If they had a kick to the other side instead of the young kid, like there wouldn't have been that mistake. He would have he would have trucked it up. So I think he does a lot of the heavy work for us. I loved Matto's con contribution. Um, but I, I, I think Will was terrific and, and defensively he was good too. That's actually a, a really good shout. I think Will's definitely worth the one point. I'm going to deviate a little bit and be a little bit sentimental. Uh, the 200 gamer today, Reagan campbell Gillard, still cracked 100 metres, had some uh, tone-setting hits in defence. So I'll give the one point just on the back of it being a milestone game for the big fella. 
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of our podcast. A round of applause for Muggo. Thank you for being here tonight and listening to us. Remember, the Cumberland Throw is all things Parramatta Real, so head to the Cumberland Throw, whether it be on our socials or on our website. You've got plenty there to read as Eel supporters. Thank you to Parramatta Leagues for having us here. Parramatta Leagues Club is the home of the Eels. Go, you mighty Eels. Good night and thank you, everyone.